On the night of April 26th, 1986, as the fourth reactor building at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant burned, a plume of radioactive material ejected from the core of the reactor was carried west by the wind. Two people became immediate casualties of this plume, Katerina Ivanenko and Ivan Orlov. But the plume did not only cause immediate human damage. It left a wound on the face of the earth, commonly referred to as the Red Forest. Thirty years later, the site of the Red Forest turned red again. This is that story, from beginning to end. In the morning hours of April 26th, Pilots flew into the cloud of smoke that escaped from Chernobyl as it drifted over villages. The radiation levels were astounding, 500 rongens per hour. Levels so high they could prove lethal to a human in as little as one hour. These levels prompted the evacuations of dozens of settlements, such as Pripyat, in the space of a few short weeks. But trees cannot be moved as easily as a human, and there was no escape for them as they were at the mercy of the strongest radiation. The contamination was immense, and plants are vulnerable to radiation the same way that we are. The destruction of genetic material in their cells rendered them unable to produce new ones, and many underwent apoptosis, a programmed cell death, all at the same time. When the leaves died, chlorophyll, the components of the cell producing energy for the trees, ceased to function, and these plants lost their typical green colouring, becoming the ginger brown shades that give the red forest its name. Thousands of trees dying at the same time in a highly contaminated track, marking the wind pattern of the first days after the accident. The Red Forest is not an unkept expanse of land. It was instead contained to a very well-defined area. To the south, the Red Forest borders a 330 kilovolt transmission line. On one side, the trees remained relatively healthy. On the other, they did not. The forest then follows the territory of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant northwards until it reaches the village of Yaniv which then becomes the uppermost edge of the Red Forest. It runs parallel to the village until it reaches the now abandoned allotments of the city of Pripyat, where it drops down to the transmission line again. An area the size of five and a half square kilometers, heavily contaminated and in need of liquidation. If the trees were abandoned, their rotting remains would inevitably poison the soil and then sink deep into the ground, becoming a hazard for generations to come. The soil, too, would need burying where possible, to prevent any radionuclides from leaching out of them before it was too late. But Chernobyl is never simple, and the diversity of the Red Forest would cause only chaos. Within the area of the Red Forest lies a large swampland, as well as the village of Lisove which took the brunt of the radiation plume. The liquidators did their best with what they had. A lot of trees were ultimately cut down, and then buried in large trenches within the Red Forest, still visible in satellite imagery today as parallel lines of white mounds hundreds of metres long. Some things could never be removed, however. Lizov survived the liquidation, as did many of the trees including some around the swamp. The grass had died, leaving the bare brown soil exposed, but there was nothing they could do. The site was still one of the most radioactive in the entire exclusion zone, and they had done their best. If there is something special about life, it is its resilience. Time and time again, life has faced major extinction events some wiping out as much as 70% of all the global species at the time. But life persevered, and we are around today to
to learn the story of how we got here. Few places in the modern world represent the resilience of life better than Chernobyl, and nowhere in Chernobyl represents this like the Red Forest does. Within a few short years of the accident, the Red Forest was alive once again, with new pine trees growing in the place of those burned by the radiation in 1986. These pine trees were not the only ones to grow in the region. Deciduous trees, ones that would shed their leaves every autumn, began to spread in the region, so much shorter than their counterparts outside the exclusion zone, but giving the impression that, every autumn, the red forest would become red again. Several meadows also sprung up in the region, alongside new flowers, creating a diverse area for animals that were reclaiming the exclusion zone now humans had left, from wolves to deer, bears to horses. The Red Forest became home to all of them. And so, the Red Forest became more than just a wildlife haven. It became an open-air science experiment, with scientists monitoring their populations to see how they would adapt to the radioactive environment. One of these findings proved serious. In March of 2014, it was warned that the decomposers, the fungi, microbes and insects, had not returned to the Red Forest. Some trees, dead for 28 years, seemed to be unscathed by rot. Illegal logging had left trees scattered on the ground all across the exclusion zone. All it would take is one flame, and then it would spread uncontrollably through the dead trees. On July 16th, 2016, a little over 30 years after the Chernobyl disaster, the worst fears of ecologists were confirmed. A fire sparked up at the heart of the Red Forest and spilled out of control. 33 vehicles and 155 firefighters were sent to battle the blaze. Helicopters with buckets and planes joined the struggle, but it was too late to prevent the worst. 80% of the red forest burned, the meadows destroyed, the swamps eradicated, wildlife displaced into the rest of the exclusion zone, and from above, the red forest had reclaimed its name. The crimson traces of vegetation were all that was left to remember the wildlife that once roamed those trees. But life is resilient, and eventually they returned, and more trees refusing to abandon the soil of the Red Forest, sprouted anew. Wildlife returned, as it always does, and it has propelled the Red Forest into once again becoming a miracle wildlife haven of Chernobyl. For four years. In April of 2020, more infamous wildfires tore through the exclusion zone, and on April 13th, they struck the Red Forest the second time it burned. These fires are widely considered to be the worst in the exclusion zone, with an immeasurable number of animals killed. Those fires were deliberately started by an individual, and I may return to the 2020 wildfires in particular in the future. Today, the Red Forest stands as an almost bare patch of land, the ground scoured by flames and rendered too damaged for now for trees to begin to reclaim large swathes of their former territory. It was a long decay from 1986, in spite of the perseverance of life. Nature is both a miracle, yet cruel and unforgiving. I would like to end by mentioning the album The Red Forest by post-rock band If These Trees Could Talk. While I've never read this for certain, I like to think it was inspired by The Red Forest of Chernobyl, and I really like this album, so go check it out. <laughs>